Okay, well, hello, everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to um, I welcome all of you to the Linnaean Society. I'm very glad to see all of you here in person um, for this exciting talk. Um, so I'm Anjali Goswami, I'm the president of the Linnaean Society. And for those of you who aren't members, um, the Linnaean Society is the world's oldest active biological society. And it is a very broad tent for all people who are interested or excited by um, the world of nature um, or the, the study of natural history, our members, our fellows include artists and historians, scientists, amateurs, professionals, anybody who's really inspired by the natural world. So if you are interested in the Linnaeus Society, come talk to any of us, any of the staff or, um, or trustees like myself, we'd be happy to tell you more, or you can find out much more on our website. Um, so today, of course, we are here hosting the British Ornitholo Ornithologist Club um, for this very exciting lecture by Jared Diamond. And I should mention I'm excited about this because I think it's been 20 years since I last saw Jared Diamond speak when I was a graduate student at the University of Chicago in the Field Museum and he came and gave a talk there. So I'm, uh, I'm very excited to see the, uh, the 20 year later version, which I imagine is on quite a different topic. So to actually... Um, Introduce the talk. I'm going to invite the chair of the British Ornithologist Club, Chris Story, up here. Um, and at the very end of the talk, we all have time for questions. If you do want to ask a question, can I just ask you to come up and speak into this tiny mic that is over here? And we'll also be taking questions from our Zoom audience um, who are, who are uh, logging in from home. So thank you, and it's all over to you. Thank you very much. I just must adjust this screen slightly so Jared can see me. Well, may I say on behalf of the British Ornithologist Club, how grateful we are to Professor Goswami and the Linnaean Society for facilitating this joint event, an event that's been a long time coming. At the start of 2020, we had looked forward to celebrating in, in conjunction with the Linnaean Society, the year of our thousandth meeting since the inaugural meeting of the club on the 5th of October, 1892. We'd planned two talks in, in the premises, one with Jared Diamond in November and one with Professor John Felser in November. In the event, however, the pandemic put paid to all that. Luckily, however, we were able jointly with society to Zoom John Felser's talk later in that year. And now, at last, we're here to mark the occasion with Professor Dime's talk on New Guinea and its marvellous birds. We're delighted to be here and thank all those in the society for making it possible. Now, I've known Jared since we first met at Cambridge in 1958. He was doing his PhD on the physiology of the gallbladder. And I remember a, a remarkable meal when he cooked a delicious pike whose bladder he'd used in his work. Our paths widely diverged until now, many years later, we meet again. As I'm sure you all know, he's a very distinguished geographer, historian, author of many outstanding books, and among his many honours recipient of the Royal Society's Science Books Prize. However, this evening, we welcome, welcome him as a distinguished ornithologist. Jared has contributed over the years many articles to the BOC's bulletin, detailing his travels in New Guinea with David Bishop, guide and photographer. We look forward very much to his account of that island and its remarkable birds. Jared, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Chris. Good morning from me here in Los Angeles. Good evening to you over there in London. It's a great pleasure for me to be here this evening talking to you from my wife's study in our house in Los Angeles, a mile from the University of California. Um, where I teach. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be with you for numerous reasons. Um, one reason is, of course, my long and happy association with the British Ornithologists Club, in whose bulletin I published 
virtually all of my ornithological papers for the last decade or so. And there's also my identification with the Linnaean Society, which for centuries has been preeminent in natural history. Another reason for my pleasure, as Chris mentioned, is my long, happy association with the BOC's officer, Chris, with whom I shared a flat 64 years ago when both of us first came up in 1958 as students at Trinity College, Cambridge, and then we rediscovered each other recently through the BOC. Another reason for my pleasure is that I get to talk to you about New Guinea birds, objectively the most fascinating subject in the world. And I'll talk about their preeminent role in the development of our knowledge of ornithology that caused the British Ornithologists Union in 1909 to pick New Guinea as the site for the Union's Jubilee Expedition. New Guinea was also the site for the great biologist Ernst Meyer to develop his ideas about speciation, the formation of species. And New Guinea has contributed disproportionately to our understanding of the biological phenomenon of sexual selection. And then finally, being with you this evening is an opportunity for me to talk about my life's work with you who share my passion for natural history. Since 1964, when I first went to New Guinea, I've led 31 expeditions to New Guinea. Could we have the first slide, please, which will be a map of New Guinea? Since 1986, I've been visiting New Guinea um, with my colleague, David Bishop, um, whose wonderful photographs you're gonna see throughout this talk. Um, on this map of New Guinea, um, you'll see um, that the island is long from east to west. I've studied birds on the eastern half, which is the independent nation of Papua New Guinea, on the western half of New Guinea, which is the Indonesian province of Papua. I've worked on both watersheds, the northern watershed and the southern watershed. I've studied birds from sea level up to 4,000 meters. You'll see along the north coast, northwest coast of New Guinea in black, those 10 outline mountain ranges separate from the central range. I've surveyed birds on all 10 of the outliers. I discovered and I made the first ascents of the highest peaks of four of those 10 outliers. And the highlight of my New Guinea career, and perhaps the single discovery for which I'm best known among scientists, was that on the summit of the Foya Mountains, that black dot in the middle of the north coast of New Guinea, on the summit of the Foya Mountains, I rediscovered New Guinea's long lost golden fronted bowerbird that had been previously known only from four specimens that turned up with unknown provenance, turned up in a Paris hat shop in 1895. Numerous expeditions went out to New Guinea to try to find where this amazing bird lived. And in 1981, I found that it lived at the top of the Foya Mountains. So what's so special about New Guinea birds? Why have they been so important in the development of ornithology. There are three sets of reasons. New Guinea birds themselves, New Guinea itself, and New Guinea peoples. Let's begin by talking about the advantages provided by New Guinea's remarkable birds themselves. Most famous among New Guinea birds are the remarkable bird families that evolved in and that have remained confined to or centered on New Guinea and Australia. And I mentioned Australia because for most of the last million years at Pleistocene times of low sea level, New Guinea and Australia have been joined together in a single continent, just as Britain and Europe during Pleistocene times of low sea level were joined in a single continent. Among those 
families that evolved in New Guinea and Australia and are still virtually confined to New Guinea and Australia are, of course, the birds of paradise, which are mainly confined to New Guinea, plus just two species each in Australia and in the Moluccas. Could we see the next three slides in sequence, please? These next three slides are three birds of paradise, beginning with Wilson's bird of paradise. And here, after Wilson's on the next slide, you'll see the King of Saxony bird of paradise with these crazy plumes coming out of the head. And then the next of these slides of bird of paradise is the blue bird of paradise, which is widely regarded as the most beautiful bird in the world. Well, that King of Saxony bird of paradise in the previous slide, the male has coming out of its head feathers modified in the form of two long wires. And along those wires are modified feathers that are like small blue pieces of hard plastic. So remarkable that when in 1894, the first King of Saxony bird of paradise skin arrived in Europe, the head of the British Museum's bird collection said, any fool can see that this skin is a artifact pasted together by humans, but no, it's a real bird. So birds of paradise are a family endemic to New Guinea and Australia. Another family that evolved in New Guinea and Australia and is still strictly confined there are the bowerbirds. Could we have the next slide, please? Male bowerbirds construct and decorate the most elaborate animal structures except for those made by humans. And here we see a bower of the Fogelkop Gardener bowerbird, which is a hut several yards across of sticks decorated with all these objects that you can see, purple fruits and red flowers, and then in front a orange and white packet of Indonesian noodles that the bird stole from our campsite. So the bowerbirds, the males, build these bowers which serve to woo female bowerbirds. Like human males, bowerbird males have evolved to transfer the attention of the female from decorations of the male's own body to decorations acquired or built by males. We human males acquire and we flaunt sports cars and fancy clothes to attract women. Male bowerbirds build their own bowers and decorate and flaunt the decorations of the, the bowers, the fruits and flowers and, and um, butterfly wings and snail shells and other natural objects in the jungle, plus near human habitation, the Indonesian soup carton that you can see in front, plus stolen shiny car keys and stolen shiny ballpoint pens and shoelaces. When I was studying a bowerbird at its bower in the Wandaman Mountains of New Guinea, I was there wearing my boots, which had bright yellow shoe boot laces, and the bowerbird owning the bower hopped onto my boots in which I was standing and attempted to pull off my yellow boot laces to decorate its bower. So bowerbirds, like birds of paradise, are a second family that evolved in and virtually confined to New, New Guinea and Australia. And then there are the mound builders or megapodes. The next slide, please. These are, here we have a megapode with big legs scraping up the ground. These are the only birds in the world that incubate their eggs, not with their own body heat in a nest, but instead using heat sources other than body heat. Most commonly compost mounds of vegetation that they scrape together to make piles dozens of feet wide and up to 20 feet high. The heat of the composting vegetation incubates the eggs or else they'll lay their eggs in volcanoes and use volcanic heat or they'll lay their eggs in sun-baked 
sand. So those are the mound builders, the third of those three remarkable families that evolved in New Guinea and Australia and are still largely confined to there. In addition, New Guinea birds include several families that radiated in New Guinea and Australia, whether or not they also originally evolved there. Pigeons, for example. Pigeons nowadays are all around the world, but New Guinea has 52 species of pigeons and the family of pigeons may have evolved in New Guinea. The next slide, please. New Guinea pigeons range from the world's smallest pigeon to the world's largest pigeon, which you can see on this slide, um, a crowned pigeon, the Gaura pigeons in David Bishop's beautiful photograph, the world's largest pigeon. New Guinea pigeons are very diverse. They include fruit pigeons living in the canopy of trees, eating saw fruits, and ground pigeons living on the ground, eating hard nuts. Then the next slide, please. Another family that is spread around the world, but that radiated in New Guinea and Australia are the parrots, of which New Guinea and Australia have 47 species. That's about one seventh of all the world's parrots. New Guinea has the world's greatest diversity of parrots, including the pygmy parrots here in this slide. Pygmy parrots are about four inches long. They nest in termites mounds. New Guinea also has large parrots, the cockatoos, and then it has the brush tongue lorries um, whose tongues are elaborated in the form of brushes to sop up the nectar out of flowers. And then the next slide, another of those families that radiated in New Guinea are the kingfishers. Kingfishers are spread around the world today, but New Guinea has 22 species, which is about one fifth of the world's kingfishers. And whereas your kingfishers in Britain and Europe and ours in North America are freshwater kingfishers, in New Guinea, we have freshwater kingfishers and saltwater kingfishers and forest kingfishers and savanna kingfishers. We even have a nocturnal kingfisher. We have the world's largest kingfishers, the kookaburras. We have a kingfisher with an enormous bill that it uses to plow the ground and dig up earthworms. And then in New Guinea and Australia, we have the paradise kingfishers that you can see in this slide with a long tail like birds of paradise, presumably playing a role in sexual selection. But with the paradise kingfishers, both the male and the female have these long tails. Another group of birds in New Guinea, illustrated in the next slide, are what you can call the convergent lookalikes. Here we have a bird that in Europe you would say is a creeper that clings to bark. Um, in New Guinea and Australia, the first British colonists found lots of birds that looked like European birds, creepers and nuthatches and wrens and warblers and sowing flycatchers. Just as in New Guinea and Australia, the first British colonists found mammals that resembled European mice and rats and cats and wolves, but it was clear that those mammals were convergent on, independently derived from, from European placental mammals, because those New Guinea Australian mammals shared a pouch, their marsupials, that warned us that they're convergent on the European mammals. In the case of these New Guinea lookalikes, they didn't share anything like a marsupial pouch. And it wasn't clear that they were convergent until DNA studies in the last couple of decades show that they are unrelated to European nuthatches and wrens. Could we have the next slide, please, which will illustrate a New Guinea wren, cocktail like your wrens, but brightly colored. These New Guinea wrens and creepers and nuthatches and so on, DNA has shown represent several different radiations unrelated to North American and European nuthatches and wrens, but convergent on them. And finally, among New Guinea birds, I'll mention the surprises. Could we have the next slide, please? 
There are two New Guinea birds that were discovered already in the last century. And they're common and wide, common and widespread, like this one, the so-called hooded pitahui, um, or the greater melan pitta, which is at least locally um, uh, common. But it was discovered only in the last couple of decades that this hooded pitahui, a supposedly well-known bird, is poisonous. In fact, in New Guinea, there are two lineages of poisonous birds. And not only is it remarkable that they're poisonous, but their poisons are nerve poisons called batrachotoxins, which you'll know as the poisons of South America's poison dart frogs. So these two lineages of New Guinea poisonous birds and poison dart frogs have acquired the same poisons, batrachotoxins, independently. And that was a big surprise. Another surprise was that the greater melampita, a New Guinea bird known from specimens with peculiar wing abrasion and a bony spur on the wing, we knew nothing about its habits. We just had six specimens until in 1983, I discovered that the greater melampita lives in limestone karst terrain. It lives in deep, narrow limestone sinkholes where it roosts and nests underground in these deep sinkholes. And it evidently props itself and sc scurries out of the sinkholes that are too narrow for it to fly out of. And that's how it abrades its wing and tail feathers. And somehow the bony spur in the wing, whose function we don't understand, probably plays some role in its life underground. So this was a surprise, an underground bird. Those then are special advantages of New Guinea birds themselves. Now, what are the advantages of New Guinea itself apart from its birds? I'll mention six advantages of New Guinea. One advantage is New Guinea's equatorial location combined with its elevation. New Guinea lies on the equator, which means that a lot of New Guinea is hot rainforest, but New Guinea has mountains up to 5,000 meters 16 and a half thousand feet high. And so with those high mountains, they're high enough for there to be glaciers, snow on the equator. New Guinea is one of only three places in the world where there's with mountains high enough on the equator for there to be snow on the equator. The other two places, of course, being the Andes of South America and Kilimanjaro and the mountains of East Africa. But whereas the Andes and Kilimanjaro are too far from the coast to be visible from the coast. In New Guinea, the mountains are close enough to the coast that they were already spotted by European voyagers sailing past New Guinea in the 1500s. These first European voyagers saw up in the sky white, and they reasoned correctly that the white is snow, glaciers on top of New Guinea mountains the glaciers are visible from the coral reef surrounding New Guinea. So, so that New Guinea is one of just two places in the world, the other being a mountain range in Northern Colombia and South America. New Guinea is one of only two places where you can stand on a coral reef and look up at the white of the glaciers, or where you can stand on a glacier and look down on the coral reefs. But New Guinea terrain is so difficult to move around in that it wasn't until 1962 that New Guinea's highest glacier was climbed by the great Austrian mountaineer Heinrich Harrer, who's also famous for having made the first ascent of the Eiger North face in the Alps. But Heinrich Harrer also made the first ascent of New Guinea's highest glacier, 16 and a half thousand feet. Because of those high mountains on the equator, New Guinea offers a range of habitats, like the range that we encounter at sea level if we drive or walk from the equator to the poles, a distance of 8,000 miles, a range of habitats from rainforest to snow. But in New Guinea, you encounter that range of habitats within 20 miles. Could we have the next seven slides, please, which illustrate the sequence of habitats that you encounter in New Guinea as you walk from the coral reefs 
to the sandy beaches backed by mangrove and then the lowland rainforest we see here. Above the lowland rainforest as you start to climb up, you come to hill forest dominated by oaks. And here's David Bishop and me standing at the Deagle River with a native built vine bridge across the Deagle River in the hills in the oak forest. Above the oak forest um, is the montane forest dominated by Southern beech notophagus, notophagus trees. Here you see an airplane coming into one of these dirt one-way airstrips um, in the mountain forest of New Guinea. Above the mountain forest is the subalpine forest dominated by conifer trees that are even above 300 feet tall. Above the conifers are the alpine grassland that we see here with cycads and tree ferns. Above the alpine grassland is, as you see here, um, alpine bogs and then alpine rock fields. And finally, above the alpine rock fields is the snow. We can hold this slide um, for a moment. Um, so that range of habitats, each habitat with its own distinctive species confined to that particular elevation, means that New Guinea has a much higher species diversity than a similar lowland area at the equator. That's one advantage of New Guinea. Another advantage of New Guinea is that New Guinea is of the right size and the right species diversity to pursue ornithology. When I first went to New Guinea and came back to the American Museum in New York, American Museum of Natural History, to study my bird specimens, in the museum at the same time was a famous ornithologist who specialized in South American birds. And when I chatted with him and told him about New Guinea birds, he said, didn't you feel that New Guinea is impoverished in birds, impoverished poor in bird species? No, absolutely not. And here's why I don't feel New Guinea is impoverished. Uh, New Guinea is often referred to as the world's largest tropical island, but you shouldn't think of New Guinea as a big tropical island. You should think of New Guinea as the smallest continent. To biogeographers, the difference between an island and a continent isn't an arbitrary difference of size, but a continent is a landmass large enough that speciation can proceed to completion in birds and mammals within the confines of the landmass, whereas in islands, islands are too small for speciation to proceed to completion. And New Guinea is big enough to have had speciation producing many species rich endemic genera and even endemic families from speciation in New Guinea. In all, New Guinea has 515 resident breeding species and superspecies, 515. It's possible to get to know almost all of them within a few years. Whereas in South America, with its 3,000 species, it's impossible to get to know those 3,000 species in a lifetime. New Guinea's 515 species, that's not impoverished. That's rich enough to test important biological questions but it's not so rich as to be confusing. And so I would say that New Guinea is of the right size and the right species diversity to pursue biology. It's not too rich and it's not too poor, but it's just right in size and in diversity. Then another advantage of New Guinea is its simple geographical layout, which is illustrated in this slide here. I had already showed you in my first slide a, a map of New Guinea, which has a central range that runs from east to west. Along that central range, birds differentiate. So you get different subspecies or different allo species, members of a superspecies from west to east. And that's illustrated here by the allo species, the representative members of a superspecies of the Astrapia ribbon-tailed birds of paradise. From east to west, you'll see aloe species number two and number three and number four. 
And then in the outline mountain ranges on the North Coast, Allo species number one and number five. That's a simple geographic layout, very convenient for studying evolution of montane species. And in the next slide, the lowlands of New Guinea form a ring around that east to west central range. The lowlands are divided into three blocks in a ring, the north coast lowlands, and then the western lowlands, and the south coast lowlands. In each of those lowland blocks in a ring around the central range, they may evolve distinct subspecies and distinct allo species, members of a superspecies. And that's illustrated in this slide, um, which depicts the ranges of the Chalcopsida lorries. Um, one allo species in the west, in black, the black Chalcopsida, another in the north, the Duvenbodi, the brown Chalcopsida, and another in the south, um, the Scintillata, the colored red and green Chalcopsida. So that's a simple layout, a simple geography for studying speciation in the lowlands and in the mountains. That simple geography of New Guinea makes New Guinea much simpler than South America for reconstructing evolutionary history. The next slide illustrates a further advantage of New Guinea. New Guinea is surrounded by hundreds of satellite islands, each island supporting a different subset of the New Guinea avifauna. But those hundreds of New Guinea islands are of three different types. There are oceanic islands lying in deep water, islands that have had no recent land connection to New Guinea. And they're reachable only by bird species capable of overwater colonization. Then there are the land bridge islands depicted on this map. The dotted line around New Guinea is the edge of the New Guinea Australian continental shelf, the shallow continental shelf, and the, the black islands, the six black islands here, um, used to be at Pleistocene times of low sea level, there used to be hills and mountains on the dry continental shelf. But as sea level rose at the end of the Pleistocene, the shelf was inundated and these mountains became cut off as land bridge islands, reachable only by species that, are, that, that can, um, reachable by species that are unwilling to colonize over water, like flightless mammals such as kangaroos, but also hundreds of New Guinea birds, although perfectly capable of flight, are unwilling to colonize over water. And the only islands that they occupy are these land bridge islands. And then the final group of New Guinea islands are volcanic islands on a tectonic plate boundary off the northeast coast of New Guinea. Um, those volcanic islands are prone to explode and defaunate themselves, exterminate all species like Krakatoa in Indonesia. But Krakatoa is a single island in Indonesia. New Guinea has a couple of dozen Krakatoas that have exploded and sterilized themselves and been recolonized by birds that specialize in rapid overwater colonization, so-called super tramps. Super tramps evolved in the New Guinea region. These birds have very high dispersal ability because of all those Krakatoa-like islands, birds with high dispersal ability. The remaining geographic advantage of New Guinea um, is that its avifauna has been virtually completely cataloged at the species level. I say that because since 1939, we've discovered only two, allos, two new allo species, representatives of superspecies on New Guinea, and only one possible full species. And so the species composition of New Guinea's avifauna is well known unlike the case for South America, where every year ornithologists are discovering new species in South America, and every few years a new genus. So if you want to discover a new species, go to South America. But if you want to study biological problems in a well-known avifauna that's virtually completely known, 
go to New Guinea instead. A remaining advantage of New Guinea, and could we now see my last five slides, a remaining advantage of New Guinea is New Guinea people themselves. Until recently, um, many people in New Guinea were hunter-gatherers who did not farm, but they depended upon wild birds and animals and snakes for their protein. Most New Guineans in modern times have been farmers, but New Guinea farmers have only a couple of species of domestic animals, chickens and pigs in low numbers. And so for their protein, they depend largely, again, on hunting and hunting wild birds and wild mammals and snakes. So they know a lot about their wild bird species. Um, New Guineans, uh, traditional New Guineans are walking encyclopedias of biological information. Whenever I come to a village in New Guinea, I begin by quizzing New Guineans and asking them for the names and descriptions of local birds in their area. And routinely, they'll describe to me 150 bird species in the vicinity, and they'll describe their calls and give me the names of these birds in the local language. Until recently, until within the last half century, uh, within the last century, uh, most New Guineans were still using stone tools rather than metal tools, and they were engaged in tribal war, traditional societies. Things have changed since then. They're now using metal tools, but there are still old New Guineans uh, who still hunt in the jungle and can guide you to rare birds, can tell you of the habits and the calls of the rare birds. And so it was New Guineans who told ornithologists about the other poisonous birds. It was New Guineans who explained to me the habits of the underground bird. And New Guineans also told me that nocturnal birds in New Guinea call frog mouths. They say, sit during the day with their mouths wide open. European ornithologists have observed that, but New Guineans say they sit there with their mouths wide open because on their palates, they secrete a sticky, smelly substance, sweet tasting substance that attracts insects. So insects fly into the bird's mouth, the bird closes its mouth, and the bird acts as a living fly trap. That sounds incredible. It hasn't yet been confirmed by Europeans, but it was also incredible when New Guineans said that there are poisonous birds and underground birds, but it was true. And so my guess is that New Guinean, that New Guinea birds also include these living fly traps. So those are advantages of New Guinea birds, um, themselves, of New Guinea itself, apart from the advantages of New Guinea's remarkable birds, namely, New Guinea's equatorial location and elevation, New Guinea being the right size and having the right species diversity, not too rich, not too poor. New Guinea having a simple geographic layout that lets you reconstruct evolution. New Guinea having these hundreds of satellite islands of three types. The virtual complete cataloging of New Guinea birds at the species level. And then these wonderful New Guineans with their knowledge of local birds. So we can turn the slides off now. Those are, that was my last slide. And from now on, I'll just talk. All right. So what have we learned of fundamental biological interest from New Guinea birds? What do we learn that's clearer in New Guinea, easier to learn in New Guinea than elsewhere? And I'll give you a couple of examples. My first example is culture in animals specifically culture in New Guinea bowerbirds. A biological definition of culture is a set of behaviors that characterize a local population of a species and that are transmitted, not genetically, but by learning and copying. Culture, biological culture, was previously considered unique to humans and claims of culture in animals were dismissed as controversial. But then Jane Goodall and other biologists established cultural transmission 
for populations of chimpanzees and gorillas and other animals, such as the learned differences in tool use by different chimpanzee populations that are not inherited genetically, but are learned by observation. Well, New Guinea's Gardner bowerbirds are wonderful examples of cultural transmission in the form and decoration of their bowers. The Fogelkop Gardner bowerbird um, in the Arthak Mountains and the Tamrau Mountains and the Juan Dalman Mountains builds a hut of sticks that you saw in one of my earlier slides. And that hut is decorated with many colored objects that you also saw in my earlier slide. The bower in the Arthak, Tamrau, and Wandaman Mountains is decorated with colored fruits and flowers and butterfly wings and beetle elytra. Well, in the Kamau and Thakthak Mountains, I discovered two other populations of that same bower bird. They use sticks to build not a hut, but a tower several meters high, and they decorate their tower not with colored objects, but with uncolored black, white, brown, and gray objects, stones and st snail shells, and pieces of charcoal and lumps of clay. Those differences in decorations are not because of different availability of decorations in different mountain ranges. Of course, the Kamau and Fak Fak Mountains have the usual colored fruits and flowers and butterflies, and the Tamrau and Arthak Mountains have the usual white and gray and black snail shells and stones. The different decorations in the different mountain ranges are instead a cultural difference transmitted by learning. But when I first reported on those black and white and gray decorations of the Kamal and Fak Fak Bowers, other biologists suspected that that meant that the Kamau and Fak Fak Bowers belonged to different species and that the differences were genetic. But it turns out that no, the two populations, the ones decorating in color, the ones decorating without color, they're morphologically and genetically almost identical. The differences exist even within the same mountain range in the Kamau Mountains within a distance of 10 kilometers. In the central Kamawa Mountains, the bowerbirds decorate with colored fruits and flowers, as in the Arfak Mountains. And then five or 10 kilometers further south, they decorate with brown squares of clay. And then five or 10 kilometers further south, they decorate with white and black snail shells. When I went out to New Guinea in 1983 and told my wife Marie about my plan to study Bowers. Marie gave me a set of colored poker chips of different colors. And I did experiments. I put out my colored poker chips next to the Bowers of the Kamawa Bowerbirds that decorate in black and white. And I put out red, blue, and purple and yellow poker chips. The Kamawa Bowerbirds indignantly threw away my red and blue poker chips and they used only my white and black poker chips in the colors that they use for their natural decorations. Whereas when I took Marie's poker chips to the Arthak Mountains, and again, offered a range of poker chips, the Arthak bowerbirds that decorate with red and, red and blue flowers and fruits, they happily took my red and blue and purple poker chips, but they threw away my white and black poker chips. So these are cultural differences and they're transmitted by learning. The opportunities for learning are that young male bowerbirds have a female-like plumage. So young male bowerbirds visit the bowers of the adult males. They go into the adult male's bower. The adult male then displays to the young male and the young male gets the opportunity to inspect the bower from the inside and to see its decorations and to see the display of the adult male. It takes a young male seven years to learn and practice the bower style and the bower decorations. And similarly, female bower birds learn what is the locally correct bower style and decoration style by observation. Females sometimes 
go around to bowers in groups. And that gives young females the opportunity to observe the taste of adult females um, to see what bower style and bower decorations please the adult females. So bowers then are like Jane Goodall's chimpanzees, an example of cultural transmission of traits, not genetically, but by learning and observation. That's one phenomenon that's easy to study in New Guinea birds. A second example of a fundamental biological phenomenon, important phenomenon that um, in fact was, was understood first in New Guinea birds is the phenomenon called aggressive mimicry. Mimicry for the purposes of deflecting aggression. That's mimicry of aggressive larger species by smaller species. The great biologist Alfred Russell Wallace, co-discoverer of evolution with Darwin, when, when Alfred Russell Wallace was working in the Malay archipelago, he claimed to have discovered mimicry of birds by other birds. He claimed to have discovered mimicry of Indonesian friar birds the, uh, belonging to the family of honey eaters that evolved in the New Guinea region. Wallace claimed that he had discovered mimicry of flyer birds, flyer birds by orioles, the orioles that you have in Britain and in Europe. And Wallace made that claim because on two Indonesian islands, these birds of very different families, Wallace found that on each island, the oriole resembled in detail the plumage of the friar bird. But on another island, the friar bird and the oriole looked different from the first island but they resembled each other. And so Wallace suggested, argued that the Oriole had evolved to mimic the Friar bird in its plumage. Well, Wallace's claim was scornfully dismissed, but then within the last few decades, shockingly to you European ornithologists and to us North American ornithologists, cases of mimicry were discovered not between two different families, Wallace's Orioles and, and Friar birds, but within the same, same family, different species within the same family that had been thought to be close to each, closely related because they're so similar, turned out to be distantly related. In Europe, your white-backed woodpecker and your lesser spotted woodpecker that look extremely similar. It's not because they're closely related. They're somewhat distantly related, but they're extremely similar in plumage. And in North America, our greater and lesser yellow legs that are our equivalent of your red shanks, greater and lesser yellow legs are so similar that we have a lot of difficulty telling them apart. And it used to be thought that they were closely related, but no, they're not closely related. Instead, the lesser yellow legs has evolved to mimic the greater yellow legs. Well, in 1982, in the New Guinea region and in Indonesia, I restudied Orioles and Friar birds. And whereas Wallace knew of only two cases of parallel geographic variation, I was able to recognize on eight different islands, eight cases of parallel variation. That's to say on eight different islands, the Friar birds differed among the islands and the Orioles differed among the islands. But on each island, the Oriole resembled the Friar bird often so closely that they are difficult to tell apart and they are specimens that have been mislabeled in the British Museum of Orioles and Friar Birds. For example, Friar Birds, like many honey eaters, have patches of bare skin on the face, black patches of skin in various forms and shapes, but the Orioles mimic those black Friar Bird skin patches by black patches of feathers. Paradoxically, the greater the size difference between the friar bird and the oriole, that's to say the more dissimilar the friar bird and oriole are in their size, the better is the plumage mimicry. It's the larger friar birds that are mimicked most exactly by the smaller orioles. You may say, who is mimicking who? It's clear that the friar birds are being mimicked by the Orioles. 
because the fryer birds are typical honey eaters in their brown plumage and their bare face patches. But the Orioles, as you know, in Europe and Africa and Asia, your European Orioles are yellow and black. The Indonesian and New Guinea Orioles are unusual. They're virtually unique in being brown like fryer birds. So it's Orioles that are mimicking fryer birds. But I discovered that in turn, the New Guinea Oriole is mimicked by a smaller honey eater, the streak headed honey eater. So what is the benefit of mimicry? Why do the smaller Orioles mimic the larger fryer birds? And why does the smaller streak headed honey eater mimic the larger Oriole? Well, Orioles and fryer birds and streak headed honey eaters feed on fruit and flowers. There are lots of species that feed in fruiting and flowering trees. And in those trees, there's a lot of size related aggression of bigger birds displacing and driving away smaller birds. The fryer birds are the biggest birds in the New Guinea fruiting and flowering trees. They're particularly nasty and aggressive as the biggest species in the tree. Fryer birds attack lots of other species in the tree, but I've never seen the New Guinea fryer bird attacking the small oriole. And in turn, I've never seen the oriole attacking the smaller streak headed honey eater that mimics the oriole. That's why a greater difference in size between the fryer bird and oriole is paradoxically associated with more perfect plumage mimicry. The bigger the fryer bird, the nastier and more dangerous, more aggressive the fryer bird to the oriole. So a bigger fry bird has to be mimicked more perfectly by Orioles. In the 40 years since my 1982 Oriole fry bird paper, many other cases of that aggressive mimicry have been discussed around the world. Those of you who bird, bird watch in South America, you are familiar with the confusingly similar mimicking Kiskadee flycatchers and mimicry in toucans Hawks in various places around the world, smaller hawks, mimic larger hawks, motmots, petrels. And if you consult the Linnaean Society Zoological Journal for the year 2014, in the Linnaean Society's 2014 journal, you'll see an article by Richard Prum of Yale, which has a table listing about 50 cases of aggressive mimicry around the world. So that's a second biological phenomenon about which we've learned a lot from the New Guinea region. And then the last example that I want to give you is of mixed species foraging flocks. Any of you bird watch in the tropics know that in many areas of the tropics, um, there are what are called itinerant mixed species flocks of small insectivores, insect eaters living in the middle story. And they're itinerant. They're year round, they move, move around year round, following each other. In Britain and Europe and North America, we have mixed species flocks, but only in the winter. In the tropics, these year round flocks of small insectivores converge on one color pattern, which differs from area to area. So in some area, the flocks, flock members are all blue and yellow. In another area, they're green and yellow. In another area, they're green. The flocks joining in flocks serve multiple functions. Some members of the flock serve as sentinels. Others practice kleptoparasitism. Others flush prey used by other flock members. All those different species in a flock looking similar confused predators. And it suggested that the convergence on one color pattern facilitates flock cohesion and facilitates birds in the flock following each other. Well, New Guinea has also a mixed species flock, but not of small birds, of medium and large birds. And they're not, they're not insectivores, but they're omnivores and fruit eaters. And they're not in the middle story, but they range from the lower story to the canopy. The species in, these New Guinea, in this New Guinea flock, they're all endemic to New Guinea. The flocks are led by pseudo babblers and poisonous pitahueys. And the fact that a leader of the flock is poisonous 
makes one wonder whether mimicry of poisonous species by non-poisonous species for birds, just as in butterflies, is part of the reason for convergence in color pattern in these New Guinea flocks. But the New Guinea flocks don't converge on a single color pattern. They're not all blue and yellow or they're not all green as in South America. The New Guinea flocks converge on two alternative colors. The members are either brown, some of them are brown, and some of them are black. And in some members of the flock, the male is black and the female is brown. The mimicry is very close. Some of the, many of the species in the flocks, they're brown olive and they're difficult to distinguish from each other. The flock members belong to many different families, not just the Pitahueys and the pseudo babblers, but also birds of paradise and pseudo Pitahueys and drongos and pseudo drongos and cuckoo shrikes and honey eaters and whistlers. So why do the New Guinea flocks converge on two different colors rather than just on a single color as elsewhere in the world? My speculation is that it's because the New Guinea flocks have had a long evolutionary history with their bird of paradise members. Many bird of paradise species join the flocks, but among birds of paradise, typically the females are, females are brown, presumably to be cryptic at the nest, and the males of many birds of paradise have glossy black display plumage. So since the New Guinea flocks have as core members, birds of paradise, which are either brown or black, the whole flock has evolved with some brown species and some black species and some species like cuckoo shrikes that are brown in the female and black in the male. In short then, what is so special about New Guinea birds? New Guinea birds have contributed disproportionately to our understanding of ornithology. That's partly because of the advantages offered by New Guinea's remarkable birds themselves. It's partly also because of the advantages of New Guinea itself, including its equatorial lo location, its high mountains, New Guinea being of the right size and species richness, New Guinea's simple geography, its hundreds of islands of three different types, and our nearly complete knowledge of its resonant composition. And also New Guinea has cont contributed disproportionately because of the advantages of New Guinea peoples and their encyclopedic knowledge of New Guinea birds. But I have to warn you, before you rush out and buy a ticket to the last flight, buy a plane ticket to the last flight, departing tonight from London to New Guinea via Singapore and Jakarta, there's a big disadvantage to visiting New Guinea and to studying New Guinea birds. New Guinea is a uniquely fascinating place because of its birds and because of its landscapes and because of its wonderful peoples. Once you've gotten to know New Guinea, the rest of the world will seem boring to you by comparison. Thank you for inviting me to join you this evening talking about New Guinea birds. Thank you. Jared, thank you very much. We have, can we take, yeah. well. You have to ask on the tiny mic there. We have questions on the screen, but if, the, if there are questions in the room, let's take a question from the room first. Could you please come up to the. Um... You'll have to hold it up. Oh, thank you. You mentioned some very different uh, sexual selective strategies in, for instance, the King of Saxony bird of paradise and in the bower birds, one of them being more direct physiological, the external anatomy of the bird and the other being much more behavioral. Is there any research on the relative advantages of these two? Uh, are the bower birds more successful by being more concealed? 
that's a that's a very interesting question. In the case of in the case of the the birds of paradise, um, most birds of paradise males have fancy plumage and also fancy display. But in the bower birds, it was Tom Gilliard at the American Museum of Natural History who recognized that the fancier the plumage of the male bower birds, some of them having beautiful yellow crests the duller the bower and the simpler the display. And the male bower birds with the dullest plumage have the fanciest bowers and fanciest displays. So Tom Gilead suggest, argued that in evolution, there's been a transfer of the female's attention from the ornaments of the male's body to the ornaments of the male's plumage. And some of my men graduate students suggested to me that the same is true of us humans. Uh, they observed that, according to them, it's the duller, less attractive young men who have the fanciest sports cars, parallel to the Alibers. Hypothesis. That's a great question. Thank you. Can we take one from the from the screen? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I'll <laughs> Oh, okay, funny. I mean, you can stand out, spread it from here. Okay. Okay, thank you. So this question is from Paul Buckley, who asks, um, I wonder what advice you would give to those seeking to conserve New Guinea's forests and wildlife, both in PNG and Papua, given that the ecology is similar, but the politics and practicalities are different. And then following up on that, what research would you prioritize if you were a young biologist working out what would be most useful? And they specify local or um, coming in from externally. So uh, another great question. Um, protecting the forest and protecting their birds um, in, in New Guinea. Um, on both halves of the island, in Papua New Guinea, I've worked with the New Guinea Wildlife Service and devised a national park plan. My first visit to Indonesian New Guinea um, was at the invitation of the Indonesian new government, government to devise a national park plan. On paper, both halves of the island have national park systems that encompass most types of habitats. Uh, the difficulties in protecting the forests, um, there are not hundreds of wildlife rangers to protect the forests, but both Papua New Guinea and Indonesian New Guinea do have increasing numbers of wildlife rangers. And fortunately, many of the forests are protected by their isolation and their distance. The deal, because New Guineans depend upon the forest for their materials, for their wood, and for the birds and for the hunting, the deal that the governments have made with local people is that local people can continue to use the forest that are national parks in their traditional way of for materials and for food, but they just can't go around in national parks with shotguns. Um, so um, I've been in national parks, both in Indo New, 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 Indonesian New Guinea, where the parks are big, and in Papua New Guinea, and the isolation and the size of the national parks is the best protection. But elsewhere in the world, it's worrisome in New Guinea, just as everywhere else. I actually asked a follow up to that. <laughs> um, so uh, talking about um, when you were talking about the rangers um, that have been trained in these systems, I was wondering also, you mentioned a few times in terms of you know, scientists from Europe and North America. But after all these years of, of working in, um, in New Guinea, um, obviously, I would hope that there would be some trained ornithologists um, that work locally and are based locally um, that can maybe document some of these amazing behaviors that you described, which I think would be fascinating to see in, in the published literature. So um, can you maybe speak a little bit more about that? Because I, you know, I think one of the most important things that some of us who get to work in areas where we have certain advantages can do, obviously, is to train as scientists around the world that can work in local areas, which probably will have the most impact on conservation. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's an, another key question. The issue of of train training 
indigenous ornithologists, not just having Europeans and Americans going out to study birds there. The Indonesian government, bless them, now makes it a condition that if you want to study birds in, in Indonesia and in Indonesian New Guinea, you got to have Indonesian biologists along with them, with you, um, 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 to train them. In Papua New Guinea, um, my um, pro projects in Papua New Guinea in the 1980s were with the Papua New Guinea Wildlife Service. And a great advantage for, for training ornithologists in New Guinea is that you don't need to train them. So many of these traditional New Guineans, they know far more about the birds than we do. They train us. Um, and it's a matter of just teaching them the English language names of the birds that they know very well. So they're already trained ornithologists. And fortunately, both sides of the island are requiring um, that visiting ornithologists take along local biologists and provide them with training. That's really excellent to hear. Thank you. Um, do you have any questions? In the room? Do you want to take more questions from the room? Yeah. Anyone else? There's a lot of this online otherwise. Well, I'm here. It's not a question for online otherwise. It depends on the strength of the screen. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have one from Ray, um, who says, um, flower species that use um, very co colorful materials also use dark and dull things, not colorful to us. I'm not sure if it fully conveyed that question. Um, I don't know if that makes sense to you, I'm a mammalogist, I don't know. But Ray, maybe you can... Um, I, I, I did not understand the question well because of re reverberation. Could I ask you to repeat the question a little more slowly? Oh, sure. Sorry. Um, figured you could understand my very fast talking as an American. But um, it's a, uh, so this is from Ray. And Ray, if I'm getting this wrong, please do um, add to the question. But it says, um, flower species that use very colorful materials also use dark and dull things that are not colorful to us. Um, not sure exactly what the question is. So maybe Ray, if you can add to that question and I'll skip to another one in the meantime. Um, okay, here's one from Steve Lonker. How does the magnitude of upslope shifts in the tropical montane bird distributions in response to global warming compare to upslope shifts in the temperate zone? Again, could you repeat a little more slowly, please? <laughs> sure, sorry. Oh, check out there. Yeah. <laughs> Up there. Oh, right, right. Which one? This is from Steve. Is it Steve? That's the one. Look, how does the magnitude of upslope shifts in the tropical montane bird distributions in response to global warming compare to upslope shifts in the temperate zone? Good question. The shorter answer is, I don't know. The longer answer is that upslope ships have been documented in New Guinea, as well as in the temperate zones. In 1965, I surveyed the elevational ranges of birds on Mount Karamui in the Central Highlands. That was 1965. And uh, around 2012, Ben Freeman and Alex, Alexandra Class Freeman went back to Mount Karamui. Uh, they located my camps up Mount Karamui and they measured the elevational ranges of birds whose elevational ranges that I, I had measured. And what they found was that birds had shifted up slope on Mount Karamui by about, as I recall, 150 meters in the nearly 50 years since I had surveyed Mount Karamui, but 150 meters on the summit of Mount Karamui when I was there in 1964, there were some birds in the top 100 meters of Mount Karamui. Well, in the last 50 years, their habitat has been lifted off into the sky. Um, so birds are moving upslope and birds at the tops of the mountain, their habitat is disappearing. Um, I can't give you the numbers for how it compares in the tropics and the temperate zone, but that's an important question. Thank you. I just, is that, yes, there's a question from the room. Could you kindly come and walk into the mic? Can you speak now, please? I'll try. Oh. <laughs> yes, hello, Professor Diamond. 
Um, I am aware that you uh, probably are a pupil of Ernst Mayer, and that uh, you first may have gone to New Guinea to study birds with Ernst Mayer. Could you tell us a little bit about that early connection between Meyer and yourself? Yes, I can, I, I can certainly tell you about the connection between Ernst Meyer and myself. Um, I never went to New Guinea with him because uh -huh. Ernst was in New Guinea in, from 1928 to 1930 and didn't return. But Ernst Meyer was for decades my closest collaborator. Um, Ernst, when he moved to Boston from the American Museum, in 1953, I think, wanted to collaborate with physicians to study the selection, possible selective um, effects of blood groups. And my father was a specialist on blood groups. So Ernst and my father collaborated on the selective advantage of blood groups. Dad introduced me to Ernst. Um, Ernst advised me on my first New Guinea project with John Turborg. And then for 30 years, from 1970 to two, 2002, um, in 1970, I received in the mail a fat pile of maps from Ernst without any explanation. And then there followed le a letter from Ernst saying, here are maps of birds in the Solomon Islands. Um, I prepared these maps, but I'm too big. Could we have a project and collaborate? For 30 years, I collaborated with Ernst and we published a book it was a wonderful collaboration because Ernst and I belonged to different generations. Um, I, um, I have used mathematics more than Ernst did, but nevertheless, we were very compatible. Both of us loved to make lists. And whenever we, one of us would ask the other a biological question, Ernst's response was, let me make a list of the birds. And my response was also, let me make a list. So. Collaborating with Ernst Meyer was a, a wonderful experience for me. Thank you very much. I must say we're coming towards the end of this fascinating evening and apologies to all those people who've kindly sent in messages via the internet. If I may, I'd take one more question from the, from the, from the internet and then ask Robert Peace Jones if you'd say, a, a, a word of thanks to Jared for a really splendid evening. The question is, do these birds migrate? And if so, where to? Good question. Do New Guinea birds migrate? There is no, oh, I was about to say there is no New Guinea bird that migrates out of New Guinea, but I take that back. There is some migration back and forth between New Guinea and Australia. Um, there are Australian breeding birds that winter in New Guinea, and there are some birds, the Torrey Strait pigeon, for example, that breeds in New Guinea and that migrates to Australia. We don't know whether additionally breeds in Australia, but with those few exceptions, New Guinea birds do not migrate out of New Guinea. Why? Because it's tropical on the equator. There is migration within New Guinea, um, there is seasonal migration, particularly altitudinal mi migration in New Guinea. And then there's lots of migration from the temperate zones, both from the Australian temperate zone to New Guinea in the Australian winter, and from the Siberian temperate zone to New Guinea in your Siberian winter. So that, for example, your common sandpiper um, and your um, a couple of your your wagtails winter in New Guinea. Thank you. On behalf of the British Ornithologists Club, and I'm sure of the Linnaean Society also, I should like to deeply thank Professor Diamond for his wide ranging and insightful talk. Delayed it is, as it has been by the COVID pandemic and sadly still not able to have been delivered by him in person, it has nevertheless still been hugely well worth waiting for. Historically, the core focuses of the British Ornithologist Club since its foundation back in 1892 have been on the taxonomy, systematics and distribution of birds. 
Professor Damon's talk has comprised the second of two special lectures planned to celebrate the passing of the VOC's milestone of 1,000 evening meetings. Appropriately, as was fervently hoped during planning, both talks have admi admirably addressed these issues. And Professor Diamond has gone well beyond this in addressing wider biological topics. During his career, or should I say, one of his seemingly numerous careers, Professor Diamond has revolutionized our understanding of the birds of the New Guinea region. As he has emphasized, this is an area of peculiar geographical complexity that is re reflected in its complex and extraordinary avifauna. He has achieved this through both the original fieldwork he has so fascinatingly discussed tonight and the wider published synthesis for which he is renowned. The British Ornithologist Club has welcomed the links he has had with it over this time, notably in publishing an array of papers in his bulletin. New Guinea's avifauna is extraordinary. In both his wider career and in his wonderful oversight talk tonight, Professor Diamond has been more than equal to the task of investigating and communicating its intricacies. We are deeply indebted to him for his willingness to share a lifetime's experiences of what is so special about New Guinea's birds. Thank you, Professor Diamond. All right, thanks, Jared. I'm going to switch off the web stream now. Thank you. Hold on.